in the 80s, the popularity of the tournament had waned. Uh, had gone from having to qualify in regional centres to not even getting a full field of 128, I think it was. So I decided with Chris Butt, and together with Brian Lever, who I worked for at the time, to guarantee a large purse to get people interested. I think the guarantee was £5,000 we guaranteed prize money, which was quite a lot of money in those days. Um, and with our connections, we managed to get a big field uh, and it was well supported by uh, Scandinavia in particular and it was then put back on the map. Um, we managed to use connections from our time on TV with the World Championship, etc. And I believe I got Con John Conte, who was a friend of both Brian Lever and I knew him a little bit myself to present the prizes. So the tournament was back on track again. And as I remember, uh, we had players like Mats Carlsen, Goran Gorgendorf, or, uh, Goran Bergendorf, sorry, uh, Tony Rosenquist, uh, and a big field from Europe. So it was one force to contend with. And I think John Coote won it that year. Uh, and I think Tony Rosenquist was second. I can't remember whether we had a, a, a ladies section, I can't remember whether we did or not. But anyway, it was back on track, uh, and a lot of that was thanks to Brian Lieber, Chris Buck. Uh, I think it was called Rebel International Match Play, because the company was uh, Brian Lieber's company, who I worked for. And the rest, I suppose, is history. <laughs> Well, first of all, those were in the days where you had to qualify um, in regional centres. Uh, I'd won the Bowling World Cup the year before, so 1972, so I was beginning to get known a bit, shall we say, so I decided to qualify in my hometown of Newcastle, much to the disgust of the locals. Um, however, I did qualify and, and uh, took place uh, at the, at the, um, the match play in 73. Uh, Got through the first day, so we had to stay uh, overnight to obviously take part in the second day. It was always everybody's aim to get into the second day of any tournament. Uh, I can remember I was a great friend of Meg, Meg Shaw as she was then, Meg Jaw as she was before sadly she passed away, uh, and a local bowler from Peter Nesta Freshwater. Now we all made the, uh, the second day and we had no hotel so we all three of us slept in my car in the car park. And as it happens, I went on to win it. Meg Jordash won the ladies section, and Nesta Freshwater came second in the ladies, so my car had a bit of history there. Um, as for the actual tournament itself, I actually went through the winners section, having not lost a match, beaten, I think, um, Phil... Oh, I know I beat Guida Zorba in the final and the semi-final, I'll, I'll, I'll think of a name in a minute, who it was, but quite a good bowler. I went through, as I say, in the in the winner's bracket, not losing the match and I think one of the highest averages of the day at that time, I think it was about 198. And after that, um, I was approached by Tommy Marshall and then signed for Mallory, Mallory Chargers, came down, moved down to London. I'm going to say the rest could be called history. Match play was not a, a format that was played very much in England anyway. You had the regular ones, which was the London match play. And as far as I can remember, the only other one was the Manchester match play at Bellevue. There wasn't that many match play uh, competitions to be had in the, in the, in the UK. So it wasn't a, a, a format that I played in very often. We had a lot of singles competitions and sixes and stuff like that, but not many match plays. So apart from the London match play um, and, and the Manchester one, I can't think of any other ones, not even abroad.